whether you're on campus or online, we're, we're so glad that you're with us. My name is Neil. I serve as one of our, our servant leaders, one of our pastors here at the church, and it's just a great joy to be with you this morning. Um, if you're online, we're so stoked you're here, and if you're on campus, let me ask you this question. How many of you guys are thankful to be able to be on and in campus? Okay, yeah, that's good. Well, that doesn't come without hard work. Last Friday, 60 volunteers, and then on Saturday, 120 volunteers came and made that possible for us. And so I just want to say thank you. We had some friends from Destin come, some different churches that I'm connected to down there, and you guys came, and some other people came, and it was great. And so we just want to say thank you. Um, as you're aware, we have five buildings on campus, and two of our original buildings, um, which were built in the 80s, um, currently flooded. And so our, our administrative wing and the wing that we use to house preschool ministry are, are both without sheetrock, four feet and under. And they're concrete slabs. And, um, you know, my, my father mentioned last Sunday very clearly, and I'm so glad he did, because this is, as we can tell from records, the fifth time that these buildings have flooded. You go, well, come on, boys. After, after time five, what, what should we do? Um, well, we've done quite a bit. We've, we've collaborated with the county, with, with our local officials, and so many drainage projects and different dynamics, and yet she still floods. So I'm just going to ask you real quick, if I can have your attention, if I can see your eyes, um, would you just be praying with us and for us as we just try and prayerfully consider, well, Lord, what should we do? Like, these buildings... Um, I mean, we'll go for round six, you know. Round 12 is a real fight, right? But we'll, we'll go six if we need to. Um, but maybe not, you know, Lord, maybe. Um, anyway, if you'd pray for the leadership in that, it's... Um, how many of you guys used to go to church in that building? Anyone go to church in that building in the 80s? Look at that. That's awesome. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, that's awesome. I went to church in that building. Um, so I have a great attachment to that. But thank God we know that the kingdom of God is not meat nor drink. It means it's not physical, right? People don't know that. You guys, what? I thought it was physical. No. Our, our home, did you know that your forever home can't be flooded or can't be burned down? In the West, they experience fire. In the South, they experience water. But forever home is forever established. So I'm thankful for that. With that said, um, would you grab your Bibles and open up to the book of Acts? Acts is the fourth book that you'll find in the New Testament. As Pastor John mentioned, there's Gospels. And these are really accounts of history that are honestly, if I, can, if I could say this, they're more, they've got more historical value and more historicity and more background support for their authenticity than the Iliad and the Odyssey. So these, these are not works of fiction. These are not religious accounts. They're historical accounts of a man who actually lived through the lens of four individuals, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then in the book of Acts, Luke just keeps on writing. Don't you love Dr. Luke? He's like, I got more to say. And he, he talks to this guy named Theo. His real name's Theophilus, but that's... Have you ever heard that corny joke? What's the awfulest name in scripture? Theophilus. You got it. Lucas got it. All right. No, no, no. I'm not going to do no corny jokes. But in the book of Acts, here's what you see. You see both a description. Can everyone say the word description? description. You see a description and times, at times, a prescription of what the church is. Who has the right to say what a church is? Is it you? Is it me? Who has the right to say what defines a church? The one with the biggest social media following? The best hair? The slickest presentation? The most gifting and oratorical dynamic? Who has the right? Who gets to say what a church is and is not? Who gets to define the who, what, where, when, why, how? Is it me? I'm going to tell you real quick. No way, no how. You know me. You go, not that guy. He's got a lot to learn. And I would agree to that. But who does? And why does it matter? And why should you care? This morning, as of this morning, I guess, I very humbly serve as your pastor. This is my first Sunday as the pastor of, um, of You Precious People. Oh, yeah, thanks. That's very kind. Last Sunday, my, my dad and I, Pastor John and I, just kind of affirmed 
this dynamic of new seasons. You know, with the Lord, it's never about retirement. It's about rehirement, right? Like you think you get to a point, I'm going to retire. No, I got a new job for you. That's the Lord, man. He's so tricky that way. Like rehirement, man. And so my dad's going to be enjoying a role that he's always enjoyed. Pastor John Stephen Spencer is the founding pastor of New Life Christian Fellowship that became Calvary Chapel Gulf Breeze, that became Coastline Calvary Chapel. He's the founder. But you know what he gets to do now in year 38 of serving as lead and founder? He gets to let go of lead. And as a biological son and a spiritual one, I'm just thankful that I can help with that. I, it's just an opinion. It's the NIV, Neil's interesting version. You've heard me say that. I think it's okay for him to do that. After 38 years, blood, sweat, and tears, building buildings, sending out church planners, mission trips all over the world, let the guy enjoy who he is and let him do whatever he wants. In Jesus' name, right? Like, <laughs> like in Jesus' name and whatever, you know, legally, you know, anyway, I won't get into all that. But like, but let him do that. And I'll just, to the best I can, I'm just going to serve you as the lead guy. But why? Why do this? Well, we feel it's the best way to serve you. I'll never forget what John Corson told me when I lived in Oregon. He said, Neil, multi-generational is the dynamic of a church. He says, here's what happens to churches. The zeal and the passion of the young is not understood or embraced by the old. So they leave. Yet they miss something. They miss the foundation and the roots. They may have relevancy, but they don't have the roots, no matter how talented they are. And I said, but you know what happens to the old sometimes? They don't understand the young. So they're glad to see them go. And this is what happens. You miss what resonates with everyone. And we'll say, what is that? Roots with relevancy resonates with every human. That's, did you know that you, you're part of an ancient religion, if I can use that word? It's really an ancient relationship. But our roots go deep as believers. This wasn't thought up yesterday. Who gets to decide what a church is? The one who paid the price for it. The cost was deep. I'll tell you, man, I got pockets. And they, don't, they got a, a, a wrapper of a mint in them. But the pockets of Jesus, the price for you was pure, spotless, unblemished blood. Stand among you if you have that. No one stands. I don't care who you are. I don't care what your socioeconomic platform is. What your PhD is in. You know enough, a little bit about a certain specific thing. Doesn't make you the doctor of the world because you held a doctorate. I have a friend in uh, the West Coast and his, his PhD is in childhood development, but he specialized in how to pick up and drop off children at a daycare. And that was his PhD. And I think that's helpful because, man, have you ever tried to drop off a child at daycare? Like, we need some doctor to tell us what to do with that. My buddy Lars, that's him. That's him. I love Lars. We were roommates for a season. But only Jesus gets to decide what a church is. But we believe as founding and lead pastor that we can serve you, Jesus' church, towards this end. This end right here. Hopefully the screen will work. It's going to transition. One, two, three. Oh, no, come back. Come back. We've got to talk about it. This is what I believe. Now, listen, let me have your attention. I know we're sharing a little bit jovially, but listen. What I'm going to do this morning, very simply, you see this paper in front of you, I'll explain it in just a second. You see this 10 4, one this is war, what is this? This has taken me 19 years to be able to say these 17 words. I think it's 17, I'm not that smart. Once you read it, come tell me later, but the NIV, this is what a church is, man. A church is a community. There's a lot of communities out there. You ever heard of the LSU community? Like some people do it, man. It's all about that ecclesia that's called out, that loves that school and loves that. Is it a tiger? Is that what LSU is? A tiger. They love to see him take the skin of a pig and run it up and down grass. And they're like, yes, we're going to paint our bodies for that. We're the ecclesia of the LSU. Okay, you can do that if you want. The church is just a community, man. 
But what are they a community about? They're a community about new life in Jesus. That's what brings them together. They're a community that, that lives new life in Jesus. Well, where do they live it? In the world in which they live. Wherever they live, as a stay-at-home mom, as a rocket scientist, as a, whoever you are, you live that way, man. But you're also a community that loves God. You're also a community that connects together intentionally. And you're also a community that lives on mission in your world. And this morning, I just want to give like 10,000 feet, 30,000 feet of what this is. And then over the next four Sundays, my father and I are just going to rotate. Pastor John will go first. He'll talk about what it means to be a community living new life in Jesus in our world. Can I be honest with you? I know a lot of guys. I know a lot of pastors. I know a lot of friends. I don't know anyone better to share that message. That's a guy whose nickname was Street Fighter, who came from a broken home and experienced new life in Jesus. And in some ways, some ways, some ways, why you're sitting here today. I think he's got something to say. The week following, I'll do the best I can to back clean up after that. Because he'll do, he'll do really well. Like a community loving God. I want to explain that. Today you're not going to get that. Today you're getting 30,000 feet. The week following, Pastor John will talk about what does it mean to be a community that, 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 that connects. And then lastly, I'll talk about what does it mean to be a community that lives on mission. And then we're going to get into the books of 2nd and 3rd John. You know what? That's ambitious. Before the year is up, I'm going to teach you two books of the Bible. Did the other pastor ever do that? Like in a month? No, I'm just teasing. Like, I'm just teasing. It's just a joke. No, they're like very small. They're like, and we're going to share. We're going to do it together. But we're going to get into 2nd John and 3rd John, Lord willing. And then Don McClure is going to come and open up our, our Christmas season for us. Pastor Don and Jean McClure, who started the Bible colleges back in the 70s. They're going to be here, Lord willing. We don't know what tomorrow holds, but we plan on them being here the first week in December. And Jean will be doing our women's tea, and Don will be teaching on a Sunday. That'll be great, man. Those guys are so cool. Anyway, this morning, 1041, this is war. Sounds a little weird, huh? A little intense? Well, there's 10 values, four missional mandates, and one singular vision. 10 4 1. Have you ever played the card game, This is War? And you take your cards and you have to show someone your cards. You know that? Well, that's what I want to do this morning. Yeah, there's a war going on, and we'll talk about that later. But what I want to do this morning is just show you my cards. You say, what do you mean? You know what I've seen as a pastor's kid and as a pastor? Pastors get asked a lot of questions. A lot of questions. And the who, what, where, when, why, how is a lot of where it comes from. And the is, is not paradigm is usually the second. There's usually just two paradigms of questions. Who, what, where, when, why, how, when, and is, is not. So I thought, well, maybe as we get started, let's just take this on the head. Like, let's just go ahead and say, here's the who, what, where, when, why, how, and is, is not. And then let me unpack it for you for four weeks after. It's just a simple message, a simple thought on the values, the mission, and the vision. And please, let me have your attention. Let me see your eyes. This is just us, man. I'm not saying this for every church that's ever gathered. I mean, this is Coastline Calvary Chapel. This is, these are our vision. This is our mission. This is our values. But I, I'm pretty sure it's the same thing that this thing says. I don't want to disrespect that. This is the same thing that this thing says. It just comes from this. This is what it's like in the South, man. This is what it's like on the South Coast at Coastline Calvary Chapel. So today, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to give you this little sermon sheet as a way to kind of write down these 10, 4, and 1. And here's the deal. If you're 21 and under, which is a lot of you guys right over here. If you're 21 and under, yeah, you're waving, you're 21 and under. If you fill this out and write a meaningful response at the end where it says next step, not like I'm going to throw it away, not that. If you write it, Pastor Todd and Pastor Daniel have a voucher for a free drink of your choice, all non-alcoholic, because you're under 21, and we don't serve that over there anyway. <laughs> but like, a free drink of your choice right over there at the coffee house. Do you get that, guys? Like, if you're under 21, if you take this, if you fill it out, and if you do it, and you show Pastor Todd and Daniel, you get a free drink from the coffee house. Now, if you're 22 and older, you should have a job by now, man. You can buy your own drink. <laughs> I don't got to buy you a drink. Like, 
You do. You should still do it, but I'm not buying you a drink. Like, um, we'll be, we'll do it for the kids, but not you. Um, and so, today it's our heart to unpack and begin. Father, I just pray very simply as I try to do my best to, to not draw the attention to anyone other than you and just try to explain your scriptures and even trying to show a little bit how my story relates with that. Please help me to serve your people well. Please help me not to get distracted. Please help me not to make mistakes. Please just help me. And I just pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Just want to do two things with you this morning. I just want to share a little bit of my story. Say, we did that last Sunday. There's layers, man. Remember Shrek, onions? Like, I want to share the story of Coastline. And it does have a lot to do with me because I'm here and so are you. In 2001, I moved to Southern California. I think it may have been the first time I ever even visited there. I don't really remember. My parents gave us a lot of opportunities to travel as children. And so I don't know that I'd ever been to California before then. I don't, had we been to California? Maybe, yeah, they don't know either. So we don't know. Um, But in 2001, I moved to the Inland Empire. What is that? Sounds terrible. Well, there's no water. It's Temecula in Marietta. I moved there. Why? To go to Bible college because at 19, I thought I had already failed. I thought I'd already blown it. I thought I was, I was pursuing corporate law. I was engaged to be married to a high school girlfriend. And that didn't work out. And I was like, man, I don't know what to do. So someone smarter than me said, why don't you go to California for four months and I'll pay for it. So that sounds smart. I'll do that. But there's a catch. It's Bible college. And I thought, ooh, I don't want that, man. I don't want that at all. But I went. I went. In 2001 to 2003, I lived in the Inland Empire. Only time in my life I've never lived near the water. There was a lake there, but I would not call that water. Like, I need a gulf at least, you know. Um, But here's what happened there. God began to to reveal to me that, that falling isn't failing. Falling is humanity. It's getting back up. That's being a believer, right? You know, the Old Testament, righteous man falls seven times. Here's what God did in 2001 to 2003. He was so gracious and began restoring my heart. Because I'll never forget something my mom said when we were there. She said, you know what your problem is, Neil? I said, I got a lot of them. She said, you gave your heart to someone that God never told you to. I said, yeah, you're right. That's what I did. I'm not that smart. So God was gracious. And from 2001 to 2003, he said, I I can restore that. And I'm so thankful he did. I didn't make many friends there. You say, why, you're not friendly? I I I try to be friendly. But, um, man, I was broken. I needed healing. I needed to be rebuilt. So you know who came into my life? Jim Stretchberry. (laughs) Jim Stretchberry and Ricky Ryan and Britt Merrick and Nate Wagner and Jess McKernan and Lars Linton and all these people. I, Ricky asked me to go because I met Ricky in Ireland the year before and Stretch. He said, Neil, go to Ensenada with us. I was like, where's Ensenada? There's no Google. I don't know what that is. Um, go with us to Ensenada down to this church called Horizonte and um, we're going to do this Christmas outreach. We're going to give away a bunch of free toys and you, uh, you just hang out with us. Well, sure, south of the border, never been. I meet a guy named Jess McKernan there. Jess now pastors Coastline Destin. He was one of my roommates with Nate Wagner. Anyway, I went, and I was like, well, this was kind of cool, actually. Like, I'm not so miserable. I'm not, I'm not thinking about myself. There's a lot of other people that are, like, I'm doing okay, comparatively. And then Ricky again, I finished my first year of Bible college. Ricky said, Neil, now I want you to come to Santa Barbara and you're going to be Britt's intern. I was like, who the heck's Britt? He's Britt Merrick. I don't know. Who's that? 
well, just come. Okay, I'll come. I show up my first night. I said, hey, Britt, Ricky told me to, to come and meet you. And I, he said, I'm supposed to help you. He said, I'm your intern. He goes, no, you're not. I was like, I'm not? Oh, well, well what am I? He goes, you're in the parking lot. I was like, oh, okay. It was college night, Friday night. A lot of kids would come. He said, I just need you to go and wave people. But I got a bunch of interns, man. We'll find something else for you to do. I was like, okay. Well, I'll, I'll wave at people as they come in the parking lot. I can do that. And then I was like, I probably should do more here than wave in the parking lot once a week on Friday night. Like, and Joe Dr- Stretchberry, and you don't, if you don't know Stretch, that's okay. But he says, he said, hey, baby, you're going to be with the kids' ministry. He's like, hey, baby. Like, this, if you know Jim Stretchberry, that's just his MO. He's like this really sweet Jewish guy and just, just a go-getter. He said, you're going to work with Nate Wagner. I was like, oh, I know Nate, and I know Jess. He's like, you're going to work with those boys. I'll work with them. I like them. But you're doing kids' ministry. I said, well, I don't know how to do that. I've never done that. And they said, you'll figure it out. I was like, okay. So I get there. And that first summer, man, one of the best summers of my life. I worked 80, 90, 100 hours a week. I know that sounds hyperbolic, but I promise you it wasn't. Summer camps and totally awesome Tuesdays and um, all these different things at Ledbetter and um, Zodos, Zolos, bowling, something like that, Um, and Goleta. And we just did all these kids' events, and I was just helping. Like, oh, this is great. I get to not think about myself for once. And I got paid $500 a month, and I loved it. I would rather have $500 a month doing that for the rest of my life than any sort of corporate law gig I would have pursued at St. Pete. Anyway, I went back to Bible college, graduated, and then Ricky said, come back again. We want to hire you. You're going to be our fifth and sixth grade pastor, JJH. It's like, oh, okay. I met a couple people there named um, Linda Thomas and Michael Furukawa and his wife, and they were part of a skateboard company there called Powell, and I taught fifth and sixth grade with them. And I'll never forget one guy named Andy. When I showed up, I was like, man, I don't know what to do. I've never done this. Can, can you help me? No. I was like, what? Did I offend you? I'm sorry. What happened? Like, I just need help. He goes, because he was the guy doing it. And he said, you've got the degree. You know what to do. I said, they taught me Ecclesiastes. I didn't know about 11-year-olds. Like, what do I do here? <laughs> like, you'll figure it out. It's like, oh, man. By God's grace, over time, and a lot of falling down, started to learn and worked with kids ministry, eventually became the junior high pastor and would always be at reality every Friday night. This guy named Britt taught the Bible and I, it connected with me, reality did. Um, There's something about it, I felt like it was the grandchild of Calvary Chapel, it's kind of the way I've always looked at reality. And um, Britt was teaching on Friday nights and I was the junior high pastor, this other guy named Gerald, he was the high school pastor for a minute, and then this guy named Nate was, and anyway, it was just a good season. And, um, but you know what? I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not from the West Coast. I'm from the South Coast. I didn't have any roots there, and I couldn't, 500 a month only goes so far. Like, I was like, I can't afford to live here. I've got to go back home. So I came back home, and you heard a little bit about this last week, but 2003 to um, 2005, while I was in Santa Barbara, just life friends and ministry dynamics and whatever. Left with a BA in, in biblical studies by the time I left California. Moved to Florida. Was it 06 that I moved to Florida, CC? Yeah, 06. Um, and I came back here. I had been gone since like 2000, 2006. It was right after Ivan. Does anyone remember Ivan? Oh, yeah, a lot of like, ooh. Do you know Ivan's birthday? It's the same as your pastor. Isn't that bummer? Like, September 16th, I showed up, Aubrey showed up, wherever Aubrey is, Aubrey showed up, um, Ivan showed up, and Sally showed up. So I want to be constructive, not destructive, like other people on my birthday, right? Anyway, if you don't know what Ivan and Sally are, ask somebody, they do. Um, Anyway, came to the church, started seeing it with fresh eyes again, started dating Cece, and then John Corson called me and said, Neil, come to Applegate, Oregon. I said, no, I'm not coming to Applegate, Oregon. And you know my story, you heard it last week. I said, sure, I'm there. This is a picture of John. And I, I was the only guy that forgot to take my sunglasses off. So you kind of can tell where I am. Anyway, these 16 guys, we lived in Applegate, Oregon. This was an apprenticeship model of training. Now, I've done all types of school, man. Online, on campus, formal, informal, internship, master's level. I'm in an MDiv program right now. I love school. I love, 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 love to learn. This was the most helpful model apprenticeship apprenticeship 
and it's a lost model on this generation. We think formal and informal is the way to go. And there is a way, that's a way. But it, maybe it's a way, not the way. Maybe there's another way. A way that actually outdates the formal and informal, if you know your history at all. Apprenticeship. Anyway, I'm not going to get into that. You can tell I'm a little bit passionate about it. But I came back from that. And I was talking to my dad, and I was talking to this guy named Randy Pittman, who worked here at the time, who's the pastor of Coastline Navarre. And I remember seeing stuff like this. Maybe we can throw the camera on this if it's possible. Oh, it's going to be all white balanced. But um, I remember seeing something like this. It's kind of a layout of the building and grounds that we have. It's from 2005. And I remember seeing something like this, like around at that time. And um, it's like, you know, just a dream, just like a master plan. You do that when you try to do stuff, right? It's good to write stuff down before you do it, amen? Like, before we build it, let's write it down. Um, and there was just kind of maybe, it wasn't the dream, it was a dream, a thought. Like, what if we built a bigger building? That makes sense. I mean, this building can only house so many humans. But I thought, no, that's not the way. I don't know what in the world the way is. But in just in my opinion, humbly, NIV, Neil's interesting version, that's not the way forward. That's doing 20th century ministry in the 21st. Culture is going to change. Did you know that you live? You may have missed it because you're in it. Sometimes when you're in something, you don't see it. You live in one of the most monumental times of human existence. So what do you mean? Communication for centuries was oral alone in the way in which it was transmitted. And then this guy named Gutenberg and Martin Luther showed up and it went to written. And it was able to be transmitted quickly. And then when you came to be, communication changed again. It went to visual. You may have missed it. You know, you didn't. You use the internet. You know what I'm talking about. But you may have missed the fact that communication has had three stages, and you live in one of those stages in which it's changed. Perhaps God will use what he's done like he's done in the past. Sometimes the past is helpful. Sometimes God does different stuff. But if it worked for Luther and Gutenberg, man, why can't it work for us? Why can't we leverage what's online and on campus to get the gospel out? Not, not to build multi-site. Let me explain that in a second. Why not multi-site? It's not what the church did in the first century. If you've ever read the Bible and ever just looked at a little bit of church history, the churches were independent, autonomous, and collaborative. And they didn't have to, they wanted to work together. See, a multi-site model only works with a CEO, CFO, and COO. Not a bad way to run a business. Not the way to run a church, man. It's not what God says. He says there's leaders, assistants, and members. And then there's these three other guys named God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and they're the real CEO, CFO, and COO. The leaders, assistants, and members, stay connected to them because they're going to give you your marching orders. So here's what happened. Instead of this, can we see that? No, you're kinda, you know what it is. I said, what about this? Let's look at this picture. What about this? Here's a, we got 120 miles of beautiful white sugary sand beaches. I think it's better than the in, Inland Empire. It's just my opinion. But Orange Beach, Pensacola, Fort Walton Beach, Shalimar, Gulf Breeze, Panama City Beach, Navarre, Destin. we got all these little places here, man, and they're gorgeous. And they need Bible teaching, gospel preaching, disciple making churches. we got a lot of churches in the south. Here's the difference between the west and the south coast, man. On the south, everybody's a Christian, but no one is. Right. On the west, at least they're honest. At least they'll say, no, I don't believe that, and this is why, and this is why I'm going to live the way I want to live. Here, yeah, bro, I'm a Christian. What? Christian means many Christ. Like you, you look just like Jesus in your attitudes, actions, and choices. The South is deceived. So ministry amongst the deceived is more challenging than ministry amongst the initiated. At least in the West, they're honest. In the South, you know who your enemy is because he's not flesh and blood. But it's very hard to tell who's on your team. 
because they're all religious, man. And that's not what we want. That's not what God wants. But what if we built this? You ever, anyone ever heard of CoastlineLife.com? If you've been here for more than two minutes, you have. But that's our, that was our original website when we changed the coastline. Well, what is that? Why did you do that? Why wasn't it Coastline Golf Breeze? Because we're sneaky. Because there is this vision to have an entity that serves Coastline Calvary Chapel in theological development, administrative support, communication support, leadership development, and network integrity. I love Calvary Chapel. I remember what Stretch used to tell me. He said, you cut me and I, I bleed the dove, baby. Like, that's what Stretch used to say. And I'll never forget that. But um, so do I. Like, I was born in it. I'm not the first generation. I'm not the second generation. But I am the third. And if you know anything about church history, the third is where the movement fails. And I don't want to see it die. I love Calvary Chapel. I love going down to Merritt Island and hearing Malcolm Wilde and Alwyn like play like leatherback Bible or leatherback book. It just resonates with me. The 60s and 70s, those Christians were so genuine. I don't want something that's produced. I don't want something that's franchised. I don't want something that's slick. I don't want something that's plastic. I don't want something that's corporate. I want something organic. I want something local. I'm just an, it's just an opinion. But I think that everyone 21 and under, maybe 31 and under, I'm almost 39, so I'm going to say 41 and under. I'm that weird generation that like, didn't make the cut. I, was, I graduated in the year 2000, and I'm not a millennial, and I'm not a Gen Xer. I'm the lost generation. Like, I don't know where I am, because I'm kind of digital, but not really. I don't know how to use Snapchat. But I, and I'm not like, I don't, I don't remember eight tracks. So I'm like, where am I? I don't ever know. I'm right in the middle. But... Um, but to serve collaboratively. Now let's get to the scriptures here in just a moment. So what did I do? 2006, 2020, and let's get into the word so you can see this. I rode. You rode? Rode, R-O-E, rode. I read, I observed, and I watched. I just kept rowing, just kept rowing, just kept rowing. Read, observe, watch, read, observe, watch, read, observe, watch. Row, 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 row your little boat. And I'll never forget my youth pastor, Mike Doyle, saying, Neil, you ever read this book? I said, no, man, I don't really read books. But you do, so you just tell me what the book's about. No. He said, you read the book for yourself. I said, okay. So I read this book, and listen to what this author said. He said this. A few billion people worship Jesus Christ as God every week and do so in the church as the church, yet if you walk into various churches and ask people who compromise that church what the word church means, the odds are you'll get either a blank stare or a series of conflicting definitions. He says this, and he says this genuinely. Sadly, this is even true from their pastors. In preparing for this book, I asked various pastors of some of America's largest churches, godly men and dear friends, if they have a working definition for the church. When you move from here, you will. If you're in the military, you will. When you find the next church, ask them that question. Do you have a working definition for what this is? And this is what he said. Not one of them did. They confessed they were giving their lives to building something for which they could not even define. So he goes on to say, and he has so much cool stuff here, but I'm not going to, can't do it all. He said, let me just give you a definition. The local church is a community of regenerated believers who confess Jesus Christ as Lord. Would you agree with that? In obedience to scripture, they organize under qualified leadership. Would you agree to that? See, not as many agree to that. Leader what? No. Gather regularly for preaching and worship. Observe the biblical sacraments of baptism and communion. Are unified by the Spirit. Disciplined for holiness. Scattered to fulfill the great commandment and great commission. As missionaries to the world for God's glory and their joy. I say yes and amen to that. That's what Acts chapter 2 says. But here's the problem. I can't memorize that. I'm not that smart. But it's helpful. And then I remember Mike telling me to read another book. He said, read this book. 
It's called Simple Church. I was like, oh, thank you. Simple. That's what I need. I'm a simple guy. Help me understand it simply. And this is one excerpt from that book. It's, this book is really based on four pillars, clarity, movement, alignment, and focus. You can apply this to anything you want, but this is what this applies to the church. A simple church is designed around a straightforward and strategic process that moves people through stages of their spiritual growth. Your walk with Jesus. We're going to help you along the way. The leadership and the church are clear about the process, are committed to executing it, and the process flows logically. There's movement. It's not like you just come to a Sunday gathering and that was church. No, 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 no. There's movement here. And it's implemented in each area of the church. Everything comes into alignment. The church, please listen, abandons everything that is not in that process. That's the hardest thing to kill a sacred cow. But you must if you want to move forward. So I'm rowing, I'm reading, I'm observing, I'm watching, I start to travel. I gotta go talk to other people, man. I'm not that smart. I need to talk to Francis Chan's people in Simi Valley. I need to talk to Mark Driscoll in uh, Pacific Northwest. I need to talk to Britt, I need to talk to Ricky, and I need to talk to Ray. Five people. Didn't know two of them, but that's okay, we can make friends. So all those people were willing to connect in one way or another, either their executive dude or whatever. So tell me what you're doing. What's your working definition of the church and how are you making it happen? And I listened to all five. And I said, that's cool what all five of those are doing. But that's not us. That's not us. We're not multi-site. We're independent, autonomous, collaborative. I remember talking to Britt about this two years ago. It's kind of before he decided to kind of, you know, focus really on a new season in his life. And he said, I said, Britt, what happened to multi-site with you guys? He said, I blew it up, man. I blew it up. Santa Barbara, Ventura, and Carp used to be multi-site. And he said, it's not the way. I said, I know. (laughs) I know. The only reason I know that is because you paddled out ahead of me. Because the first one through the gate always gets bloody. And so I just watched. I'm so thankful for Britt. I shared that vision with Britt and Kate, what was it, like two weeks ago or something? And Britt said, um, yeah, man. Anyway, then becomes experience, right? You have to beta test things. I moved to Destin for, for seven years, lived there, 10 years, pastored there. Please let me just say this. Don't worry. We are going to read the scripture. You're like, what in the world? This story. Trust me, we are going to get there. Remember, this is 30,000 feet. Just, just hang with me. God sent my wife and I. My wife and I and a Bible and a guitar and a one-year-old showed up to Destin with eight people. And you know that story of how different churches were planted and different things. And then I was asked to come back here. And again, not that smart. I said, No. Destin is my home. I've never lived longer than a place than I have in Destin, Florida. You say, wait, you're from here. But I lived in one house in Destin. When we grew up, we, my parents had this smart ability to like either buy or build a home, see it raise in value, sell it, and can just keep moving forward. So my whole life, we just keep moving forward. Different home, different neighborhood, but same zip code. Like we're just moving around. And that's awesome. That's a brilliant idea. But the backside of that is I never lived anywhere for that long. So I lived in Destin for seven years, seven years. Three of my five kids were born there. Let me have your attention, let me see yours. That was home. I know this is home, but I'm still transitioning. I'm still coming out of Destin. I was just there yesterday on 30A with a dear friend who gave me this bike and I got all these friends down there. Like I thought that's where we were hanging our hat. So I bloomed where I planted, right? Like 30A in Destin. I mean, I love golf breeze now. Don't get me wrong. But how many would you say, like, maybe 30A or Destin is not a terrible place to hang your hat? Like, yeah, it's not. Chris Tomlin lives there. He likes it. Um, If it's good enough for Chris, it's good enough for me, man. Um, Anyway. But God said, no. No. You cannot serve this vision and mission from here. You must go back home. And when I finished Destin, I finished a degree in, in a, uh, what was it, in Master's in Leadership. And one of my profs said, Neil, I want you to write a vision, mission, 
and value paper. This is from Calvary Chapel University. I said, are you allowed to use those bad words in Calvary Chapel? Like vision, mission, and value? We don't talk about that stuff. Like I grew up on Chuck and we don't do that. We don't have vision statements. We don't have, they do. They just just don't want it to be too corporate is all. They don't, I don't want to be disrespectful. No, they do. They just don't want to make it all about that. And I respect that. But the backside of that for me was I never learned about it. I never knew, I didn't know what a vision statement was or how a mission statement and value, why does all that matter? That stuff on a wall somewhere. Let me show you why it matters. Take your paper out, if you would, and your pen. And I want to invite the five men who are going to be sharing scripture with me this morning to come up on stage. Here's why it matters. Here's why it matters. The Bible does give a blueprint of what the church should value, hold dear, and practice. Number one, preach the gospel. Listen to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. I passed on to you what was most important and what had been also passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and he raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. You know what's so cool about that verse, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4? If you don't know how to share the gospel, open up your Bible, read that to somebody and say, may the spirit of God bless you. Because that's the gospel. And we are going to unpack these values. Don't worry. You're like, that's all you're going to say about preaching the gospel? I got so much more to say. Can't wait to say it. But I need four weeks. You've got to give me four weeks. Preach the gospel. The second is be baptized. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Rob is going to read that about baptism. Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, do you have to be baptized to be saved? No. Do you have to have a wedding ceremony to get married? No. But if you don't, grooms, you're dumb. No, I'm just kidding. Like, you may not be stoked later. Like, you might want to celebrate that thing. That's a momentous deal. Baptism is the public display of what's happening inwardly. It doesn't save you, but it sure does publicly declare, just like a wedding ceremony. Thirdly, worship in song and in life. Psalm 95 says... Let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Romans chapter 12 says, Brothers and sisters, give your bodies to God. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice. That's the kind he will accept. This is the true way to worship him. Billy Graham once said, The greatest sin in America is listening to a sermon. Because listening to a sermon is not living the Bible. Yeah, you need to hear the sermon so you know what to live. But living it is where it comes alive. Number four, pray in the Spirit. Balin is going to read James chapter 5, verse 16. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Prayer is powerful. Over the next four weeks, we will unpack that. Number five, learn and live the Bible. 2 Timothy 3 says, all scripture, how much is all, church? Good job. Is inspired by God and it's useful to teach us what's true and make us realize what's wrong. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what's right. I'm so thankful for the Bible. So thankful. James 1 says this, that if you look carefully into the law, the perfect law, the Bible, that sets you free and you do what it says and you don't forget what you heard, God's gonna bless. Obedience brings blessing. So let's, as a church, value learning and living the Bible. Number six, receive communion. Now, Buddha. Say, I know Buddha, but you don't know this Buddha. This guy's name is actually Buddha. That's crazy, isn't it? Listen to what Buddha's gonna say. He's gonna tell you something different than this other Buddha you've heard about. But Luke chapter 22. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Valuing the body and blood of Jesus is something that we should value. Number seven, live in community. Acts chapter two, verse 42 says, the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, sharing of meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. Number eight, learn. Oh, yeah, you should learn this. But also, 
live to give. Now this is going to be our youngest reader this morning. So I think it's the, maybe one of the shorter verses, but make sure you give Lucas some love after he reads this. It's not that, it's hard to do this. So 2 Corinthians chapter 9, live to give. You must each decide in your heart how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Good job, Luca. Now, the smartest guy in the room, I can say that, is that guy. This guy's smart, man. Rocket scientist stuff, like, uh, I almost said verse 9. Number 9, live to serve. The reason I say this, this is a long verse, so we're going to give it to Ken. Ken's going to read 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 through 11. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all your strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ken. Last one, 10. Live on mission. Jesus said in Matthew 20, 18, 28, verse 18, Boys, all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me, all authority. Therefore, go and make disciples. This is the mission. The mission is not getting that second island. The mission is not building that portfolio. The mission is not traveling and getting this experience. The mission is not finding that long lost lover. The mission is making learners of Jesus. You do that organically and strategically. You do that formally and informally. But you do it. And you may say, there's so much more you could have said. Trust me, I know, man, but I'm trying to like not keep you here till tomorrow. So, but these 10 values, I know there'll be kickback to this. Because you say, what about this? And what about that? And what about this? And what about that? And what about this? Yes, yes. But their foundation comes from this. This is their values. Four missional mandates that then we do because of these values. <sighs> That's what mission is. What should we be doing? First one, we should be living life to the fullest. Who doesn't want to do that? Who doesn't want to get all out of life, all that's good? John 10, 10, Jesus said, I have come to give you life and to give you life abundantly. It's the enemy, sin, deception, lies that come to steal, kill, and destroy. You know what sin is? It's that sugar-coated poison apple. Say, what do you mean by that? You take a bite of that sugar, and who doesn't like sugar? There are some people that don't. I've met, them. I met one one time. But most of us, when we taste sugar, we're like, oh my goodness. Until you detox from sugar. I did that on Tuesday. Man, that's a bummer day. Don't do, well, just don't touch sugar. It, okay. But like <laughs> sugar-coated poison apple. You taste it and you just keep biting because you keep loving that sugar-coated poison apple. And eventually the poison starts to come over time. And this is what happens. This is what young people don't have time and experience yet to see. They're just tasting the sugar, man. They haven't been eating on it long enough to know, uh-oh, there's poison underneath this sugar. It's not your fault. You're not dumb, teenagers. You're, you're, you're just teenagers. You haven't had time yet. There's no substitute for time. T show me the substitute for time. Okay, you can't. So just, just don't keep eating the sugar because underneath the sugar is poison. And that poison will steal, kill, and destroy your life. I got friends to show you if you don't agree with me. But you should live life to the fullest. Outside the box, but inside the book. Always think outside the box, but never outside the book. Number two, what should we be doing? We should be living in love. Who doesn't want to do that, right, Walt Disney? Everybody wants to live in love, but let me have your attention. Let me see your eyes. You need to live in love with the designer of your soul, the designer of your heart. If you look for love in all the wrong places, and let me tell you where all the wrong places are, anywhere that's horizontal for ultimate fulfillment. It's not, it's not wrong to have a marriage partner or kids, or, but you need to live in love. Let me just tell you something. You don't know what love is until you've lived in love with your creator. You just don't. Sorry, I know that's rude, but it's true. 
Because a marriage partner is a marriage partner. There's no marriage in heaven. You don't find that one. That one found you. He paid for you. And if you look in another person, which you're supposed to find in the person, you will become a miserable person. Amen. Live in love. Number three, living in community. Remember all those communities that you can choose to be like, this is my crew, man. This is my team. Like there's so many crews out there, like surfers. I know a little bit about surfers. I'm not a good surfer at all, at all, at all. Skips, Skips does, man. Skip me. But like I had these surfers in my family and I've recognized something. Like when there's something about surfers. Like when they get out on the water, there's just like this brotherhood and there's nothing wrong with that. There's a community there. There's something about firemen that when they serve together, there's a community. There's something about our military men and women who serve our country valiantly, respectfully, and sacrificially, that there's a brother and a sisterhood there that's hard to find. There's something about our police officers that when they step, any community you want to talk about, isn't there something about family? Like when you're at that Thanksgiving dinner and you're like, oh, there's a Norman Rockwell. That's what we're doing right now. Like, but let me share something with you. Every community fails. Family fails you. Friends fail you. Your crew will fail you. Your brothers in arms, they will fail you at the end of the day. What community will not? I'm going to be honest with you. None on this side of eternity. You know where you're going to get to experience true community? <sighs> when the power, the penalty, and the presence of sin is done. That's called heaven. But we can taste it here. We can experience it to a, to a degree most effectively with our blood brothers and sisters, and that's the blood of Jesus. Number four, living on purpose. Living on purpose. What's our purpose? What's our mission? To make learners and lovers of Jesus. That's your purpose. I don't care who you are. That's what you're designed to do. If you've got a big platform, God bless you. Use it for what you're designed to use it for. You got a small platform, God bless you. Use it for what you're designed for. Remember Brother Lawrence. Who's Brother Lawrence? That monk hundreds of years ago that, write that, that wrote that book, Practicing the Presence of God. That monk's whose, his platform was the dishwasher of his order. And a revival broke out because of how Brother Lawrence washed the pots. Don't you dare devalue another human because you think their platform is smaller than you. Every, let me see your eyes, every single human has infinite dignity, value, and worth because they're created in, a, in the image of a Trinitarian God. So you have value. You matter. Today needs you. Don't mess with suicide. That's dumb. Today needs you. Yesterday, it was a hard day. Yesterday was the day I'll never forget paddleboarding in Navarre Beach and being called by this mom and saying, Neil, there's 50 kids that need to talk to you. I don't even know 50 kids. I only had four at that time. Like, well, who are they? Well, there's this group of, group of five. They call themselves the Destin Mafia. And they don't mean that in a bad way. They just meant it as a crew. Oh, we're the Mafia. We like to wear gold watches. They weren't bad kids. But there's this rumor of a suicide pack. We don't know if it's true, but two of them are dead. Please get here. I said, what? You want, what, what, what can I do? I know what I can do. I can call my dad. <laughs> dad, what do we do? This is what's happening. There are a bunch of surfer kids. That I think they want to talk to me because I'm, I'm a pastor and I know Yancey. Like, I think that's why they're calling me. But what do we do? He said, we go down there. So we went down there. And yesterday was three years removed from the day that Connor died. So I talked to a lot of those boys yesterday. Because death's a funny thing. He resurfaces when you don't expect him. The bitterness of it, the anger of it, the resentment of it, the hurt of it. You don't just get an 18-month manual and deal with death. You process it. But you're designed for a purpose. Let me just say this so I can wrap this up. Everybody lives but very few people live on purpose. Everybody ends up somewhere in life. 
But very few people end up somewhere on purpose. You can. There's a way. I'm not the only guy, but I can help, I can help show you the way if you'll listen. Lastly is vision. What is vision? I know this is crazy, but you know what vision is? It's a seeing word. Dun, 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 isn't that crazy? It's a seeing word. It incites stoke of what could and should be in the future. This guy. I was made to read this book by my CCU prof, Malphorus. He says this. A clear and exciting picture of the future. That's what vision is. Such as a church that God uses to motivate that ministry to accomplish its mission. That's cool. I like that. Another pastor said this. Compelling vision provides passion, motivation, direction, and purpose. Vision makes the mundane matter. Provides reason to live and the reality that you matter to the success of the vision. What's the vision? The vision is new life in Jesus in our world. That's the vision. In our world. Right, moms that got little toddlers? You want to see new life in those little babies. Right, business owners? You want to see that not just used to make a buck, but used to really help people. We want to see this happen on our coastline. First and foremost, home. Let's help the coastline. Let's help the Gulf Coast. 12 locations, independent, autonomous, collaborative, 120 mile stretch. Let's go get it. And then to the ends of the earth. See, this is the heartbeat of who we are in Destin, Navarre, and Gulf Breeze. We are a community. Love LSU, but that's not what we're about. We're about Jesus. A community that's living new life in Jesus. A community that's loving God. A community that's connecting together. And a community that's living on mission in our world. You say, how do these values, this mission, this vision, how do they play into that? Please come for the next four Sundays and we'll tell you. Or watch us online. I can't tell it all to you right now. You're, the mind can only endure what, what, the, what the seat can, right? Like, Over the next 5 to 15 years, we want to pursue being healthy. That's our goal. That's what Greg Laurie used to say. I'll never forget that. He said, I never wanted to be a big church. I just wanted to be a healthy church. But healthy things reproduce and grow. So our goal is health. But I am going to be honest with you. Remember the sermon title, This is War? Here's my cards. This is what we're doing. It's up here. This is the, I think it's the next slide. This is the vision. Did you know that you live in a very unique area? That the quartz sugary sand that's on your beaches is very unique. That Pensacola hosts the first religious service in America at the cross. I was there this morning on my bike. Did you know that you live in a politically conservative area? Did you know that you live in an area that right now you can gather in buildings? You know that, you're there. Did you know that you live in a unique area that most of the world doesn't know about? In my opinion, the South Coast? Every time I go to the West Coast, I remember the boys, I won't get into that, but Florida boys never get any love from surfers sometimes. Even though Kelly Slater came from Florida, still getting no love. But like anyway, we wanna follow the blueprint of the Bible, be filled by the power of the Spirit and the authority of Jesus' name and under the provision of our Father. We want to lean into discipleship initiatives that are both organic and strategic. I call these discipleship initiatives black heart butterfly in Coastline College. But that's just a dream. Don't worry about it. It's not real yet. So what's your next step? This is where we're done. You made it. Your next step is to row with me. I'm asking you to row with me. Say, what do you mean? I'm not asking you to do anything at this moment other than to read, observe, and watch. Over the next four Sundays, Pastor John and myself will share what it means to be a community living new life in Jesus. Pastor John will share that next Sunday. I'll share on October 11th what it means to live in love with our Creator. On the 18th, Pastor John will share what it means to be a community living connected in our world. And lastly, on the 25th of October, Lord willing, in the creek don't rise, literally, um, 
a community living on mission in our world. But today I, I hoped to serve you by giving you 30,000 feet and I took just the right amount of time because it's 1228 and we're supposed to have you out by 1230. So all we have is a benediction. Don't worry. Like there's a benediction and you're out. You can beat, there's no buffets, but if there were, you could beat the Baptist to them, right? <laughs> but here's the deal. Students, 21 and under, this is actually more about you than it is me. I'm 39. I'm halfway dead, right? <laughs> like D.L. Muta used to say when people got saved in his revivals and someone would say, how many people got saved? And I never forget this quote. He's like, man, we saw 10 and a half people get saved. Oh, 10 adults and one kid? <laughs> no, 10 kids and one adult. That adult's half dead. No, no offense, adults. I'm an adult too. I'm right there with you, man. I'm right there with you. But here's the deal. The reason the students are here this morning, please listen. I know that was comedic, but please listen to this. The church is only ever one generation away from failure. Are you investing in someone younger than you? Are you arrogant? What's wrong? Why not? 